Chapter 4. Turkish Delight But what are you? said the queen again. Are you a great overgrown dwarf that has cut off its beard? No, your majesty, said Edmund. I never had a beard. I'm a boy. A boy, said she. Do you mean you are a son of Adam? Edmund stood still, saying nothing. He was too confused by this time to understand what the question meant. I see you are an idiot, whatever else you may be, said the queen. Answer me once and for all, or I shall lose my patience. Are you human? Yes, your majesty, said Edmund. And how, pray, did you come to enter my dominions? Please, your majesty, I came in through a wardrobe. A wardrobe? What do you mean? I, I opened a door and just found myself here, your majesty, said Edmund. Ha! said the queen, speaking more to herself than to him. A door, a door from the world of men. I have heard of such things, this may wreck all. But he is only one, and he is easily dealt with. As she spoke these words, she rose from her seat and looked Edmund full in the face, her eyes flaming. At the same moment, she raised her wand. Edmund felt sure that she was going to do something dreadful, but he seemed unable to move. Then just as he gave himself up for lost, she appeared to change her mind. My poor child, she said in quite a different voice, how cold you look. Come and sit with me here on this ledge, and I will put my mantle around you and we will talk. Edmund did not like this arrangement at all, but he dared not disobey. He stepped on the sledge and sat at her feet, and she put a fold of her fur mantle around him and tucked it well in. Perhaps something hot to drink, said the queen. Should you like that? Yes, please, your majesty, said Edmund, whose teeth were chattering. The queen took from somewhere among her wrappings a very small bottle which looked as if it were made of copper. Then, holding out her arm, she let one drop fall from it on the snow beside the sledge. Edmund saw the drop for a second in midair, shining like a diamond. But the moment it touched the snow, there was a hissing sound, and there stood a jeweled cup full of something that steamed. The dwarf immediately took this and handed it to Edmund with a bow and a smile. Not a very nice smile. Edmund felt much better as he began to sip the hot drink. It was something he had never tasted before, very sweet and foamy and creamy, and it warmed him right down to his toes. It is dull, son of Adam, to drink without eating, said the queen presently. What would you like best to eat? Turkish delight, please, your majesty, said Edmund. The queen let another drop fall from her bottle onto the snow, and instantly there appeared a round box tied with green silk ribbon, which, when opened, turned out to contain several pounds of the best Turkish delight. Each piece was sweet and light to the very center, and Edmund had never tasted something more delicious. He was quite warm now and very comfortable. While he was eating, the queen kept asking him questions. At first, Edmund tried to remember that it is rude to speak with one's mouth full, but soon he forgot about this and thought only of trying to shovel down as much Turkish delight as he could, and the more he ate, the more he wanted to eat, and he never asked himself why the queen should be so inquisitive. She got him to tell her that he had one brother and two sisters, and that one of his sisters had already been in Narnia and had met a fawn there, and that no one except himself and his brother and his sisters knew anything about Narnia. She seemed especially interested in the fact that there were four of them, and kept on coming back to it. You are sure there are just four of you, she asked. Two sons of Adam and two daughters of Eve, neither more nor less, and Edmund, with his mouth full of Turkish delight, kept on saying, Yes, I told you that before, and forgetting to call her your majesty, but she didn't seem to mind now. At last, the Turkish delight was all finished, and Edmund was looking very hard at the empty box and wishing that she would ask him whether he would like some more. Probably the queen knew quite well what he was thinking, for she knew, though Edmund did not, that this was enchanted Turkish delight, and that anyone who had once tasted it would want more and more of it, and would even, if they were allowed, go on eating it till they killed themselves. But she did not offer him any more. Instead, she said to him, Son of Adam, I should so much like to see your brother and your two sisters. Would you bring them to see me? I'll try, said Edmund, still looking at the empty box. Because if you did come again, bringing them with you, of course, I'd be able to give you some more Turkish delight. I can't do it now. The magic will only work once. In my own house, it would be another matter. Why can't we go to your house now, said Edmund. When he had first got on the sledge, he had been afraid that she might drive away with him to some unknown place from which he would not be able to get back. But he had forgotten about that fear now. It is a lovely place, my house, said the queen. I'm sure you would like it. There are whole rooms full of Turkish delight, and what's more, I have no children of my own. I want a nice boy whom I could bring up as a prince, and who would be king of Narnia when I am gone. While he was prince, he would wear a gold crown and eat Turkish delight all day long. And you are much the cleverest and handsomest young man I've ever met. I think I would like to make you the prince, someday, when you bring the others to visit me. Why not now, said Edmund. 
His face had become very red, and his mouth and fingers were sticky. He did not look either clever or handsome, whatever the queen might say. Oh, but if I took you there now, said she, I shouldn't see your brother and your sisters. I very much want to know your charming relations. You are to be the prince, and later on the king. That is understood. But you must have courtiers and nobles. I will make your brother a duke and your sisters duchesses. There's nothing special about them, said Edmund, and anyway, I could always bring them some other time. Ah, but once you were in my house, said the queen, you might forget all about them. You would be enjoying yourself so much that you wouldn't want to bother of going to fetch them. No, you must go back to your own country now and come to me another day. With them, you understand. It is no good coming without them. But I don't even know the way back to my own country, pleaded Edmund. That's easy, answered the queen. Do you see that lamp? She pointed with her wand, and Edmund turned and saw the same lamp post under which Lucy had met the fawn. Straight on, beyond that, is the way to the world of men. And now look the other way, here she pointed to the opposite direction, and tell me if you can see two little hills rising above the trees. I think I can, said Edmund. Well, my house is between those two hills. So next time you come, you have only to find the lamp post and look for those two hills, and walk through the wood till you reach my house. But remember, you must bring the others with you. I might have to be very angry with you if you come alone. I'll do my best, said Edmund. And by the way, said the queen, you needn't tell them about me. It would be fun to keep it a secret between us, wouldn't it? Make it a surprise for them. Just bring them along to the two hills. A clever boy like you will easily think of some excuse for doing that. And when you come to my house, you could just say, let's see who lives here, or something like that. I am sure that would be best. If your sister has met one of the fawns, she may have heard strange stories about me. Nasty stories that might make her afraid to come see me. Fawns will say anything, you know. And now, please, please, said Edmund suddenly, please, couldn't I have just one piece of Turkish delight to eat on my way home? No, no, said the queen with a laugh. You must wait till next time. While she spoke, she signaled to the dwarf to drive on. But as the sledge swept away out of sight, the queen waved to Edmund, calling out, Next time, next time, don't forget, come soon. Edmund was still staring after the sledge when he heard someone calling his own name. And looked around, he saw Lucy coming towards him from the other part of the wood. Oh, Edmund, she cried. So you've got in too. Isn't it wonderful? And now, all right, said Edmund. I see you were right, and it is magic wardrobe after all. I'll say I'm sorry if you like, but where on earth have you been all this time? I've been looking for you everywhere. If I'd known you have got in, I'd have waited for you, said Lucy, who was too happy and excited to notice how snappishly Edmund spoke or how flushed and strange his face was. I've been having lunch with dear Mr. Tumnus the Fawn, and he's very well, and the White Witch has done nothing to him for letting me go, so he thinks she can't have found out, and perhaps everything is going to be all right after all. The White Witch, said Edmund. Who's she? She is a perfectly terrible person, said Lucy. She calls herself the Queen of Narnia, though she has no right to be queen at all. And all the fawns and dryads and naiads and dwarfs and animals, at least all the good ones, simply hate her. And she can turn people into stone and do all kinds of horrible things. And she has made a magic so that it is always winter in Narnia. Always winter, but it never gets to Christmas. And she drives about on a sledge, drawn by reindeer, with her wand in her hand and a crown on her head. Edmund was already feeling uncomfortable from having eaten too many sweets, and when he heard that the lady he had made friends with was dangerous witch, he felt even more uncomfortable. But he still wanted to taste that Turkish delight again more than he wanted anything else. Who told you all that stuff about the white witch, he asked. Mr. Tumnus, the fawn, said Lucy. You can't always believe what fawn said, said Edmund, trying to sound as if he knew far more about them than Lucy. Who said so, asked Lucy. Everyone knows it, said Edmund. Ask anybody you like. But it's pretty poor sport standing here in the snow. Let's go home. Yes, let's, said Lucy. Oh, Edmund, I'm glad you've got in too. The others will have to believe in Narnia now that both of us have been there. What fun it will be. But Edmund secretly thought that it would not be as good fun for him as for her. He would have to admit that Lucy had been right before all the others, and he felt sure the others would all be on the side of the fawns and the animals. But he was already more than half on the side of the witch. He did not know what he would say or how he would keep his secret once they were all talking about Narnia. By this time, they had walked a good way. Then suddenly, they felt coats around them instead of branches, and next moment, they were both standing outside the wardrobe in the empty room. I say, said Lucy, you do look awful, Edmund. Don't you feel well? I'm all right, said Edmund, but this was not true. He was feeling very sick. Come on then, said Lucy, let's find the others. What a lot we shall have to tell them, and what wonderful adventures we shall have now that we're all in it together.
Well, good evening, everyone. I hope you are doing well. Uh, I am coming to you from Columbus, Ohio, still in Columbus, but uh, I am currently not in my studio office. I am in my office at home, uh, in my wonderful office here at my house. Uh, for one reason, and it's one that I wish wasn't the case, um, there was, as some of you may have seen online last night, there was actually a shooting right outside of our uh, facility there on campus. And so there are some, still some things going on in the area, um, and so I just decided to work from home this night as they are still trying to catch some of the issues and the people that are involved in those issues uh, in that area. And so I'm grateful to be back with you here diving into this wonderful world of magic and whimsy um, and with these deep moral tales and understandings that uh, help alleviate these moments of sometimes fear and anxieties that can easily kind of make their 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 heads uh, bring their heads up to roar in our worlds around us. And so I'm grateful for you um, this evening. As always, if you'll put in the chat, let me know if you're on YouTube, Facebook, uh, on X, or the, wherever it may be, that um, let me know where you're coming from. Let me know uh, if you have comments, or, or I love going back and reading those during the week. Um, comments, thoughts, ideas, extra things. Last week I had some great extra comments that were thrown in. And uh, for those of you who were able to watch it after the fact, outside of the live, that ended up becoming almost like a demonic possession sound quality concept. Um, I'm so grateful for y'all's patience in those moments. And so far, from what I can see, everybody can hear me correctly, and I'm not getting any messages otherwise. So um, without further ado, let us dive into uh, chapter four here of this fantastic book, Turkish uh, Delight, is the title here. And as I've done over these last couple of weeks, sometimes I will spend a little bit more time going through and reading some of the actual sections. Other times I will uh, just skip over some of it. But my hope is that by having the audio ahead of time, you're able to catch up if you haven't been able to read it during the week and spend time uh, being able to understand uh, the, the, the thoughts and the rest from there. So we begin back with this confrontation with um, Edmund and the White Witch uh, that we kind of left off of on a cliffhanger, in essence, at the end of last chapter. And there seems to be this quiz, this quizzing, this going into depth with this White Witch who is standing there. And so she is shocked by the fact that he is um, a, a boy, uh, a, son, a son of Adam, and can't comprehend this. And so there's an aspect in which the writing gives us this impression that there's something that we're missing. There's something that we don't understand about why this is such a big deal. And in fact, um, you get to a point where she's actually getting exasperated for with him and actually says, I see you are an idiot, whatever else you may be. Um, now we use idiot more in our co in modern context as a kind of a slight in the rest instead of a descriptive concept. Idiot has always meant a very descriptive notion of someone who just doesn't have all of his faculties. And uh, I, so I think this would be more descriptive that time because you are an idiot of these events, of these things happening. And it did get me uh, thinking quite a bit about individuals who spend a lot of time, uh, how words have changed over time. And then individuals who use words out of context based off of what they're actually meant to be um, and how they're meant to be used. Uh, having grown up, um, blessed to speak two languages, um, Italian uh, being kind of more my native tongue, even though I always spoke English with my mom and my dad and the rest, and more Italian with my dad as a child, more English with my mom being around English my entire life, but also being in Italian schools all day and soccer every day, that there are moments where I've caught myself where I will hear words differently than what an, another American might hear. them. in fact, I think I, I take them far more literally because I've never often heard them in the more colloquial sense than when people use them. And this is an example of how language changes over time. And using this one, I see you're an idiot. What else? It would seem so much more of a slight to us as opposed to a descriptive nature, which is what I believe Lewis actually kind of meant in writing this. And so uh, she does finally ask, are you human? He says, yes, your majesty. And how pray did you enter my dominions? Um, then he says, I came through a wardrobe. What do you mean? And this kind of says, I opened the door and I just kind of found myself here. And um, this is one of those things where she starts to get really riled up and she's about to do something. And as she spoke these words, she rose from her seat and looked at him full in the face, her eyes flaming at the same moment she raised her wand. And then there was this feeling that Edmund had over him. He felt sure that she was going to do something dreadful, but he seemed unable to move. And then just as he gave himself up for loss, she appeared to change her mind. So in reading this this week, it got me thinking about some, uh, some questions and some thoughts. But the first one is, have you ever come into contact with evil? Um, people who are or were genuinely evildoers. Now, this is a hard one for us because in some contexts, we don't like 
calling people evil or evildoers. At least they don't think we do. Uh, we have a lot of keyboard warriors out there who love to call people evil, who, who love to toss around titles and names. In our current culture, it seems like the, the worst thing you could possibly accuse somebody of doing is being Hitler or something of that nature. Like that's, that's these titles that we use. But in, in what we're trying to ascribe to them is the evil actions of those individuals, even if there is no comparison. Uh, but we do it fairly frequently, and, and I, get this, I think this goes back into language in general. But what I'm referencing here is people who are genuinely evil, people who are seeking the destruction of others. Now, I know how some people might perceive those things about others, but I mean actual moments where you've come across. And, and there are times where I don't know if I will always share the fullness of everything that I would want in these moments. But in my time uh, in Southeast Asia— um, there was some work that I was doing with um, not just underground churches, but also some human trafficking groups. And I can say with uh, a strong assurance that there were individuals that I came across that based off of, I think, most people's perceptions one would perceive as evil. Um, whether it was the harming of children, um, the exploitation of women and children and the rest, that their unrepentant nature, the the act, the 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 choices that were being made on a consistent basis to actively harm others with no thought for how it would affect them, um, I have no qualms saying that is evil and that those things are evil. And so with that in mind, it got me kind of thinking about this because he has this encounter with this white witch and he has this feeling, you can kind of tell, like there is this concept of evil there. And um, he feels it and he almost is unable to move. Uh, unable to move in that moment. But I do want to note this, that there's a difference between knowing evil and experiencing evil. Um, you know, in those moments, it's one thing for us, if you watch a film or something, uh, and I know there's some films that just bring about a lot of emotion in people, um, where you watch like The Sound of Silence, or you, you even watch a horror film where you feel like, oh man, it's just these things are evil, you feel it. It's a very different thing to experience it. And so just as an example, even though disease is different than evil, uh, it's one thing to be a, the doctor and know the disease. It is completely different knowledge to have the disease and live with it. And so it's one thing to say, hey, I, I know what evil looks like. I've seen what evil looks like. It's another thing to have experienced evil in your life, to have experienced these horrific things that might come about it. Now, I, as I noted, evil is different than diseases. Diseases at times are outside of our control. Evil is often brought about. Uh, diseases can be the breakdown of our anatomy, can it be the breakdown of our genetics, um, but they're not inherently immoral, whereas evil, I would say, is inherently immoral. And so experiencing it is different than knowing about it. It's one thing to say, I know what it's like, uh, you know, I know what it's like, or I know what human trafficking is. It's another one to say, I've been in the places where it happens, I've seen this destruction, or I've been trafficked. I've... It's just a very different concept. Um, so I just want to note also in Psalm 5, it specifically says, For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evil doers. Um, we often don't think of with God being a God of love. We don't think of God uh, hating anything. Um, but one of the statements I think that feels powerful in our culture that always hits with me is this idea of, that God, that we must hate the things God hates. Uh, and because we, we have a generation that loves this concept of God is love, and even the Pope this week, you know, all roads lead to the same God and the rest, which is just complete heresy and nonsense, that in and of itself, this whole idea that God is love has been so played up into a way where it, we almost think that God is love to where he does not have things that he does not like or things that are outside of his character. And being that God is the one who defines what love is, and defines what the concept of love is, what the emotive reality of what love is, not just the feeling, but also its very nature that love is patient and love is kind and love is all of those things that we see throughout Scripture, that that would also mean that the opposite of those things God would hate, that they are outside of his very persona, his very essence, and thus he hates the things that these are evil, these evil do, uh, evil doers and these evil deeds. Not because he doesn't want the repentance, not because he still doesn't love the individuals or love the people, but their actions are evil and thus hate the evildoers in those ways. 
Um, you see, we've made God out to be this genie who's just there to kind of grant our wishes. Jesus is just kind of like this um, very Robin Williams genie. He's just happy that you're here. Please love him as opposed to the Jesus that we see not only through the Gospels, but the one that we see in Revelation and the one that will come back and will judge and the one that loves all, but loves all so much that he requires us to make the changes in our lives. So this con continues on, and all of a sudden you see, think that this great moment's going to happen, and maybe Edmund's going to be harmed or killed in some way. And all of a sudden, my poor child, she said in a quite different voice, how cold you look. Come and sit with me on the sledge, and I'll put a mantle around you, and we will talk. And suddenly, it's a very different conversation from this white witch. Perhaps something hot to drink. Should you like that? And so brings out this, uh, among her wrappings, a very small bottle, which looked like it was made of copper. And from there, she creates um, this jeweled cup and this beautiful stuff and a bow and a smile. Not a very nice smile, but all of this, you can kind of see this moment of enchantedness of, of, of this magical whimsy of all these things that are happening. And so she gives them this sweet and foamy and creamy uh, that warmed him right down to his toes. And then he asked him, what would you like best to eat? Now, this may not surprise you or may surprise you, but uh, Lewis obviously adds his own personal touch into this. It, is, it was well known that Lewis's favorite uh, treat was Turkish delight. So here you have a whole concept of Turkish delight, this temptation um, that he that he grants to Edmund that seemed to be his own temptation in real life, his fondness for Turkish delight. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever actually tasted Turkish delight. Um, I find it wonderful. It's probably not my favorite in the world. I tend to to uh, lean more towards um, fruits and type those types of things or fruit treats uh, in those types of ways. But this was his. So maybe in the comments you can add what your favorite uh, temptation, what your favorite dessert may be. Uh, I will also note a good cannoli. Um, a, you know, there there are some treats that just go beyond a millefoglie from uh, that Italian pastry. There are some that I, I feel the same way. So if I were ever write my chapter in this scenario, it would probably be millefoglie uh, from uh, Mario's Bakery in Scandici, Italy. Uh, it would definitely be one of those. But now he finds himself in a very different situation than he was before, right where he thought he might be killed. Suddenly she is a very different person and she's warming him with a great drink. And now she's offering him Turkish delight. And he was quite warm now and very comfortable. Each piece was sweet and light to the very center. And Edmund had never tasted anything so delicious. So uh, one of the things I really wanted to dive into tonight is the concept that we see kind of from this premise. There are these two extremes. It's one thing when you can um, evidently see or feel or even perceive the evil that is in front of you. That was the early premise of what he was getting from the White Witch. And now you see a very different one. He has been kind of lulled into comfort. You see, Satan off, often offers us the world, and he lulls us to sleep in our contentment. But beyond that, uh, and I'm going to throw this out there as a discussion point, you can add your thoughts in the comments. He offers our churches comfort and stability in exchange for our fervor and our devotion. Where in the moment we often know what is right or wrong, and I say this with all honesty and um, kind of like a broken heart at times that our churches are often seek the goal of comfort and stability over fervor and devotion, over knowing what is right and what is wrong. Um, even the concept of unity, which I do believe is something that God desires and wants, but we have often um, sought uniformity over unity or acceptance over what would be a biblical unity. And the unity is found in God, not in us agreeing on um, the changing everything that we want. Just because there's other churches that agree with you doesn't mean that what you're doing is right. In the same way that I tell people all the time, just because you have a large church doesn't mean that you're doing something right. And sometimes I will say this the other end, just because you have a small church doesn't mean you're doing something right. Oftentimes those are not the standards, but we can look at what God uses and what God says through his word as the standard for what it means to be the church. And comfort and stability, I, I don't find that in Scripture. Uh, everybody just getting along to get along. Everybody just doing their best to keep the peace is not what often I find. In fact, most of the letters of the New Testament were written to the church to stop being the way that they were being. Stop accepting these things that you shouldn't accept. I'm thinking 1 Corinthians 5. Stop doing these things and that you shouldn't be doing. In fact, I, I jokingly wrote an article years ago that was uh, titled, I don't want to be like the first century church anymore. Um, it got some pushback until people actually read it. And I could always tell the people who'd read it, 
versus those who hadn't read it, who just read the title. Because inside the article, I said, I don't want to be like the first century church anymore because I think we look too much like the people that Paul and Jesus and the rest are preaching against. Uh, where we seek to just, everybody just, you know, just do your best. And, uh, and instead of being called to holiness and be called to something more, that he offers our churches comfort and stability in exchange for our fervor and our devotion. And part of this, and I wrote an article a while back on this too, is because I believe we've fought, bound, fallen into this concept of you know, something called the average Christian, that there is such a thing as the average Christian. And it's for many, it's because we have lost our first love. We've lost our devotion and our fervor and our excitement for being a follower of Christ. And instead, it's been replaced by just attendance. And I tell my college students all the time and the people I work with that attendance is not the same thing as presence. Being there is not the same thing as actually being engaged with the things around us. And so the main reason I believe so many struggle to get beyond kind of an infantile faith is that we have all accepted that there is such a thing as the average Christian. So many of us like knowing exactly what we must do, be baptized, go to church, go to Bible class, and be good people. As these actions are biblical and God-given, I do not negate their essential value to the believer's life. But I also want to help us realize that that which is essential could also become that which is rote, that which is just something we do over and over again. We can easily turn the spiritual into the mundane and rote action. In essence, we can and have made Christianity into something mediocre. It is something anyone can do. We have taken the world's greatest challenge, dying to oneself, and made it into something so simple that we often forget what it actually entails. But true spiritual depth is not just about going to church. It's about loving God. True spiritual depth is not about going to Bible class. It's about wanting to know God. True spiritual depth is not about baptism. It's about knowing we are dead without him and his sacrifice. There is no such thing as the average Christian. There are only those who are and those who are playing at it. Now, that last statement I know is it may come off as harsh, but I, I don't believe I am called to stand back and just act like this isn't the reality. There are a lot of people who sit, and I often reference them as uh, well-dressed corpses on our Sunday mornings who sit in our pews and our Wednesday nights and our Bible classes who have not grown in their spiritual life in decades because they've made the spiritual the mundane, the rote. It's just going through the motions. And I believe God mourns this and desires for us to be different in this, that there is no such thing as the average Christian in this lulling ourselves to sleep, whether it's sleeping comfort and contentment, or we find ourselves um, on the other side where we don't even see the evil that is right in front of us, that instead we're just going, well, what, what can this world give me? And we end up serving this world much like Edmund finds himself in this moment. But we're often even convincing ourselves that we're fine, that everything is good, and that there's nothing actually wrong with us. And that is part of the problem. We are lulled to sleep, average Christians, our own Turkish delight. And maybe if that's something you can take away with tonight is the concept of average Christians as our own Turkish delight. It's that lovely little sweet that gets us every time. So he continues on, and while he was eating, the queen keeps asking him all these questions, and she's diving deep into his life. She wants to know everything about it, and he never once asked himself why the queen would be so inquisitive. She got him to tell her that he had one brother and two sisters and all the things, and she seemed especially interested in the fact that there were four of them and kept on coming back to it. And he all, and she just goes through this whole entire premise of asking, oh, you were two sons of Adam and two daughters of Eve, neither more nor less. And he keeps on saying, yes, yes, that's how it is. But she didn't seem to mind now that he wasn't calling it your majesty. And finally, the Turkish delight was ended. But it seems that this grilling of him, he had not really questioned it because he had been lulled into a stupor, a sweet stupor, uh, and eating all of this. But she did not offer him any more. But over and over again, it seemed like she just wanted more and more information. And as I was reading this, I was reminded of a thought, um, something that I wrote about a long time ago. And I'll just note this real quick. And it's, uh, I've often wondered why people do the things they do, especially as it pertains to sin. So I asked myself the question, why do I fall? Why is sin so enticing to me? And so you see, um, over and over again, Edmund finds himself just in all of this information to Satan and the rest and Satan's. Uh, and, and Satan, in this case, versus the white witch, are always so interested, it seems, in our lives. Um, and we don't often think about that, that Satan is fascinated by our lives, wants to know everything about us, wants to know 
because he's going to use those things directly against us. And I think Lewis means this correlation between the white witch and Satan, where this white witch seems to be so interested in all this because there's this gathering information that she needs because of, we'll find out later, this historical lore that was there. But in the same way with us, um, I often wondered, why do I fall? Why do I sin? And it got me thinking. It says, while I normally would say that I fall when I forget the beauty of God outweighing the temporal fleeting pleasures of sin, I think there is more to it than that. In fact, I have come to realization, and it is this, I have bought into the lie that Satan is more consistent than God. Satan understands me. You see, I know what I am getting with Satan and sin, regret, shame, and failure. And I tell myself in these moments of regret and shame, see, I told you, you would do it again. You are a terrible person. In fact, all of these questions and getting to, to know Edmund that the White Witch goes through, and later on when she's going to lie to him and say, well, don't tell him this, or don't do that, or don't say this, or, or this selling of herself as something beyond, there is a very relatable aspect to this, because if you think back, Edmund had denied that Narnia existed, then he finally said, hey, all right, Lucy, I'll, I'll, I'll come clean in the rest, just come forward, and then he goes back right back to, of course you wouldn't accept my apology. She's not even listening to me. And so he goes back and forth. And so his own failures are going to be held against him. His own shame, his own regret is what's going to draw him in, along with the allure of the sweets that the white witch is offering. It's so tangible, the allegory that we might see with sin and enticement into our own world, because Satan understands us. You see, he offers us, and over and over again, he says, see, I told you, you would do it again. You're a terrible person. And this is often exactly what I think of myself, because it is so often true. Thus, Satan plays off my own insecurities to make himself the most consistent thing in my life. It is a self-fulfilling prophecy, because I fall over and over, and I find myself relating to a broken being far more than the Creator who made me. That's why sin becomes can become so addictive and actually make one an addict, even though one is trying so hard to walk with God. So not only does he have the allure of this Turkish delight, but this white witch is luring in through information and through depth and through conversation, drawing out of him uh, not just information, but a connection to him that she will use against him in future conversations. Information in which she can be used for her glory and not the glory of God or his even his own as Edmund. God, on the other hand, constantly speaks to me saying, trust me, I have got you. And this seems so crazy to a being who doesn't feel good or pure or holy. This oftentimes makes God seem inconsistent, even when he is the most consistent being of all. Because I don't truly grasp grace, mercy, and forgiveness, as these are so rarely truly shared and experienced in a broken world. This trick that Satan has played has destroyed and continues to destroy men and women across the globe, even this very hour. The greatest trick Satan has ever played has been to make himself more relatable to us humans than the God in whose image we were made. Let me say that one more time. One of the greatest tricks Satan has ever played has been to make himself seem more relatable to us humans than the God in whose image we were made. You see, we just, we miss this. And the white witch, even though she is not human per se, makes herself very relatable because she gives and offers to Edmund the world. And you might have seen also that correlation through the scriptures when you think about Jesus and Satan directly, where Satan offers him the world, even the world that he himself had made. And yet Edmund finds himself being offered the same thing. He's offered princes, and that he will have to have, he will, that he will be a prince, but he will also have to have court people and the rest, which is why he needs to go to his brothers and sisters. And so this temptation to more is offered over and over again, even though... It's all lies in the end. So he keeps on going, and he, she basically begs him, will you bring them to me? Bring your brother and sister. He says, I'll try, but you have to give me some more uh, Turkish delight. And so and she says, no, you can't do that. And then he says, why can't we go to your house now? And he had completely forgotten about his fear at this point because he's grown comfortable with her, comfortable with this evil that once was perceived to him, no longer feels evil, so he's comfortable in this moment. And then he offers again, I want you to be king of Narnia when I am gone. He has offered the temptation of the world. And over and over again, there's this argument between the two of them um, because the queen's getting frustrated by him because he is so diving into this concept of the Turkish delight. He has bought in solely and wholly into this temptation. 
His, his face had become very red and his mouth and fingers were sticky. He did not look either clever or handsome, whatever the queen might say. I did love that Lewis kind of threw this in because I do think that we are, when we find ourselves in a world where we um, have fallen in our nature and we are sinful and we are filled and we often think we look better than we do or we don't realize what we might actually look to others. In some ways, uh, I, I do a lot of work with homeless at different times and um rarely have I found the homeless worry about their perception of how people view them on the outside because there's so many things outside of their control that they can't, whether it's just basic cleanliness or uh, track marks or drug addiction or um, the, the, the faces of those who are going through withdrawals and things of that nature. It's so evident. In some ways, I wish we could see that spiritually. In some ways, I wish we could see when someone was really struggling or someone was dying spiritually outside of just the because so often that's that's hidden by our physical selves in and of itself. Um, notice here, I will make your brother a duke and your sisters a duchess, uh, sisters duchesses. So there's all these offers layering on over. And um, I do note that, and this goes back to Edmund himself, there's nothing special about them. And anyway, I could always bring them some other time. So he just keeps deflecting and completely, uh, I think going back to being the, the idiot, uh, of completely unaware of how he's being trapped, what she's really about. Over and over again, this is just playing itself out. Uh, and he says, I don't know which way even back. Do you see the lamp? This is the direction you need to go. Uh, and see me if you two little hills riding above the trees. This is where you will come to meet me at my wonderful place. Well, my house is between those hills. So next time you come, you have only to find the lamppost and look for those two hills and walk through the wood till you reach my house. But remember, you must bring those with you. I might have to be very angry with you if you came alone. So there is temptation, but also there is uh, what always comes with sin, which is shame and doubt and regret and also uh, a control that we don't really want to admit. Um, because, much like the White Witch, Satan seeks to destroy, maim, and enslave. And he will lie and he will cheat and he will steal and do whatever he can to win that over. And John eight forty four says, You are the father of the devil. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. First Peter 5, 8, be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, lion seeking someone to devour. Ephesians 6, 11 through 12, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We far too often forget that there is one who is out to get us. Um, not just this, this concept of the white witch, obviously, in Narnia, but in our real life right now, Satan is out to get us. With the, the tragedies of what's happening just on our campus these last few days, um, there was um, two, two homeless um, individuals one shot another uh, on Sunday night um, and just outside of our campus. And then yesterday afternoon, again, a shooting just outside of it, these tragedies of, of um, the spiritual warfare that is going on because our world has bought into this idea that either this is all there is and so I'll just do whatever I want or we've lost our understanding of the beauty and the um, – well, not just the beauty, but the, the, the true depth of what it means to be human, the, the reality that we are made in the image of God. And because we've lost that, we've lost our empathy for one another, and we've lost our, in a, our, lost our ability to truly say, boy, I shouldn't do these things. I shouldn't be one who's about uh, pain and suffering and causing these things to others. And because of that, we live in this falling, fallen world, and Satan is using everything he can to continue this process. So he gives his promises, I'll do my best, uh, and we'll continue on. A clever boy like you will easily think of some excuse for doing that. And when you come to my house, you can just say, let's see who lives here, something like that. So she invites him to, don't tell anybody about it. Keep this a secret. This is a secret between you and I. Now, I, I really want to note this because secrets are where the truth goes to die. Um, I have a rule, and I've had a rule since I was uh, first went into youth ministry. In fact, I used to tell the teens this all the time. When somebody would come to me and say, hey, can you keep a secret? I always tell them, uh, no, I don't. I do not keep secrets. Um, what I will tell you is I will only tell those who need to know. Are you okay with that? And what I've found is I've never had anyone who has not been told me what they wanted to tell me. 
But this idea of keeping secrets is something that is so dangerous. And I've seen so many youth ministers fall into this, ministers fall into it, because we become people where we don't think we have responsibilities to things, or we have, or that we think we have a responsibility to hold on to things that we're not, things that are meant to be brought to light. Uh, so when, when I hear of something like someone's being abused or someone has some issues, when somebody's willing to come to me and share those things, it means that they, there needs to be a trust involved to deal with that. Just the idea that there is a secret that someone wants you to keep doesn't mean you should. Secrets are where the truth goes to die. And instead, and then if you say, I'll keep the secret, but then you know, actually, I do have to go tell somebody. Now there's trust broken too. However, I have found that every person I've ever said that to has always said, sure, okay, and still shared with me. So that's been that's my encouragement to you is I, I don't keep secrets, uh, but I will only tell those who need to know um, that there is a difference between being somebody that is of character uh, and being a gossip, being someone who just goes around and sharing the information with whoever and whenever at any point in time. There's a difference between the two. Secrets grow in the darkness. They are tended to with silent whispers and flirting glances. These secrets don't just grow. They eat the ground within, which they are planted and devour all around it, including the very soul of the one who tends to it. You see, secrets kill from within. The only way to destroy the growing darkness is to expose it to the light, and it is the light that changes everything. Every day we all hide and bury our secrets, but they do exactly what all secrets do when planted deep into the ground. They grow. In constantly trying to manage the secret, all is lost. Time, energy, spirit, and joy. For the darkness needed to hold on to a secret saps all of everything they have. But there is a moment, a beautiful moment, when one learns an important lesson. You have no secrets. That God knows all. You do not have any secrets whatsoever. For all is known. You are known, truly known, by the one who made you. And while this realization should bring about a deep sense of shame, as secrets most often are composed of shame, they can also bring about the most wonderful of deep sighs. You can finally realize that you are not fooling anyone, and that's exactly actually really good news. So with drooping shoulders, you exhale a deep sigh of relinquishment, a breath of life as sorrow and shame are cast out by the knowledge that you are known. But not only this, you are no longer you no longer have to hide your secrets, for he already knew them, and knows them, and already provided a way out of all of them. The shame, the sorrow, the hiding, the anxiety, and the pain. He took them all on himself and cast out your secrets with his presence, for he is the light. So, if you have spent your entire life hiding a secret or secrets, and you live in constant worry of being found out, you already are. So let it go. Give it to him, and he will provide the way home, a place of rest, a place of peace. Quit fooling yourself. Stop burying it all. Let the light in, for darkness is pushed back by light. For there are many who think they are hiding by standing in a church or surrounding themselves with Christians while holding on to their secrets as if their reputation was worth their very soul. Stop fooling yourself. You are known. And this is good news to the weary. Um. I wrote that a while back, but it, it seemed appropriate in this moment, even for myself. I hope you know that I'm not just, uh, it's not that I'm not just perfect. I'm not. Uh, I think you all know that. I, I don't believe I've ever pretended to be such. Uh, I have strong opinions on lots of things. Um, I enjoy writing and I make statements that others might disagree with at times. I'm well aware of this. But the reality is, is that hiding things or hiding these secrets, even from God, is the only person being fooled is yourself. That's the only person being fooled. So the reality is, in my life, there have been moments where I have lied. There have been moments where I have not done the things that I was supposed to do when I knew the right thing to do. There have been moments where, um, you know, your your thoughts get away from you. There's just so many things that I could state that I don't mean just as public confession in some way. I mean just as reality of a human being. And maybe these things will make you feel better, um, not necessarily about your own actions. My hope is that they will just simply lead to a repentance. Or if you are a believer and these are just simply things that you have hidden secret that you will simply say enough's enough. I, I, I don't want to act. I'm just fooling myself at this point in time. I know these are things I need to not just work through, but things I might need to share with someone. 
And so part of that, that's my encouragement for you this week is tell someone who needs to know. Don't let the fear bog you down. Tell someone who needs to know, whatever it may be, um, because God already knows. You have no secrets, and that is actually good news, and it's good news for those who are weary. So this is going forward. He continues on and says, please, 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 can't I just have one more piece of Turkish delight to eat on the way home? Don't miss this. This is one of those things where it's like, man, temptation draws us in and our desires, especially one, because notice if you remember back, the white witch asked him, what is your favorite? And he said, this is my favorite. Then she gave him the best thing he'd ever had of that. And that temptation has eating at his very soul. He says, no, no. And so the, the temptation is then laid before him. Next time, next time, don't forget, come soon. And Edmund was still staring when suddenly, looking around, he saw Lucy coming towards him from another part of the wood. Oh, Edmund, so you've got him too. Isn't it wonderful? And he cuts her off instantly. I've been looking for you everywhere. And there's this very strong kind of confrontation, it would seem. And she says, if I'd known you'd got in, I'd have waited for you, said Lucy, who was too happy and excited. Notice how snappishly Edmund spoke to her. But having lunch with my dear Mr. Tumnus, the fawn, he's very well. And the white witch has done nothing with him, letting me go. So he thinks he, he can't have found out. And perhaps everything is going to be all right after all. The white witch said, Edmund, who's he? Uh, who's she? And then in some instances, you look back and you realize the white witch hasn't named herself. She just said she's the queen of Narnia. And so this is when she goes, oh, she's a perfectly terrible person. She calls herself the queen of Narnia, though she has no right to be queen at all. And all the fawns and dryads and naiads and dwarfs and animals, at least all the good ones, simply hate her. She can turn people into stone and all kinds of horrible things. She made a magic that is always winter, Narnia, always winter, but it never gets to Christmas. Notice that play itself out again. She drives a sledge drawn by a reindeer with her wand in her hand and a crown on her head. At this point in time, Edmund was feeling very uncomfortable from having eaten too many sweets. And when he heard the lady he had made friends with was a dangerous witch, he felt even more uncomfortable. Um, and there are times where I think there are moments where I think when people are suddenly re have come to a realization of what they've just gone through of, uh oh, wow, that was the that was her. But he still wanted to taste the Turkish delight again more than he wanted anything else that that temptation has tied him in so much. You see, sometimes our desire supersedes our reason. When this happens, we must ask, is what I desire good, holy, and righteous. Now, I will make the argument in this case that Turkish delight in and of itself and the way that this book places out is what you would call uh, morally neutral. There's nothing inherently wrong about it. There's nothing inherently wrong about sweets. There's nothing inherently wrong about that in that situation. But there is when your desire supersedes your reason. Um, there is when it becomes an addiction. There is when it can lead to death. There is when all of those things come, come into play. And that's why when I say, is this what is this desire, is what I desire, good, holy, and righteous? Um, and so it's not just about food or sweets and the rest, but even the actions that we have in this world. Because even things that are morally neutral can become addictions and can be th stuff that are not good, that are unholy, that is not righteous. Um, you know, there are a lot of people I know who play video games. There's nothing inherently wrong with playing video games. I enjoy playing video games with my son. Uh, my family, my my wife and them, I, they, they crack me up. I'll listen in the other room playing Mario Kart together or things like that. And there's moments of joy there and the rest, but there's not addiction there. And can there be, are there moments in which you have to make adjustments to these things? Absolutely, without a doubt. But there are morally neutral things that can become addictions, that can become something more when they supersede our reason. In this case, he wanted something more then his realization that the person who had just given him this stuff was a terrible, terrible person. It was a white witch. And so I think it's just something for us to ponder upon. So who told you all this stuff about the white witch, Mr. Tumnus, the fawn? And I love this. He said, well, you can't always believe what fawns say, Edmund, trying to sound as if he knew far more about them than Lucy. Who said so, said Lucy. Everyone knows it. Ask anyone you like. But it's pretty poor sport standing here in the snow. Let's go home. So this deflection and this... Oh, you don't know what you're talking about, even though he's never met a fawn, he's never talked about, he just speaks as if he knows. Boy, if this is not um, so many of the conversations I have with a lot of college students at times on campus, specifically with uh, students who are outside of the faith, um, who will make claims about scripture, make claims about things that have no basis in reality. In fact, they find themselves back into heading back into the wardrobe and the rest. 
Um, and Edmund secretly thought it would not be as good fun for him as for her going back in over there because he would have to admit he was wrong and that he had all the torturous times he had done against her were not actually correct and he was wrong and he should repent from those things. He would have to admit that Lucy had been right before all the others. But he was already more than half on the side of the witch, too. And that has to do with his enticement. And so he's obviously not looking well. In fact, she actually says, you're not looking well. She says, no, I'm all right. Come on, then. Let's find the others. What a lot we shall have to tell them. And what wonderful adventures we shall have now that we're all in it together. But I want to go back to that whole premise. Is Have you ever met people whose perception of God is one that does not sound like the God you know at all? Uh, because the way he talks about the fawns, and he's like, well, the Fonz, you know, are not known for that. It it reminded me so much almost instantly of when people say like, well, you obviously know that God said it's okay to bash babies over the head. And you go, I'm sorry, what, where, where did that come from? And people's perception of the Bible, and I use a terminology where I say they have a bumper sticker theology. Everything they know about the Bible, they learn from a Twitter, a 280 character Twitter thread or somebody's little pithy statement and their entire understanding of Christianity or faith broadly is based off of these kind of pithy statements, but there's no real depth. And that their perception of the Bible, Jesus and God, are at odds with what the Bible, Jesus and God say about themselves. So maybe it's something you can add in the chat if you want. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with what I often would reference just as biblical illiteracy, um, people's inability, and especially in conversation, how to deal with those moments? And so it's something for us to consider uh, as you go forward this week. So... That's the end of chapter four, Turkish Delight. Uh, I hope you have had a wonderful time. I've truly enjoyed being with you on this uh, beautiful evening. I look forward to being back with you this week. If I could ask you to pray for anything this week, uh, tomorrow night I'm speaking on campus here at Ohio State at the Union on uh, if there is a good God, why is there pain and suffering? And I, I covered your prayers for that. And then so if you'd like, if you're in the Columbus area and want to come and join us, I'll be speaking there at the Ohio Union. Come and do that um, five to seven tomorrow. I'm so grateful for you all. I love you all. If I can ever serve you in any way, please let me know. Until next week, have a great one.